Welcome to the award-winning Thoughts from a Page podcast, a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network, hosted by me, Cindy Burnett, a voracious reader and book columnist who provides you with casual author conversations, book recommendation episodes, and insider information on all of the newest releases that I have read and endorse, and on the publishing industry in my Behind the Scenes series. With so many books coming out weekly, it can be hard to decide what to read, so I find the best ones and share them with you. For more book recommendations or to find my backlist of interviews, visit my website at thoughtsfromapage.com. In 2023, I have a new segment on my Tuesday episodes called Read-Alike Requests. Listeners can submit a book they loved and tell me why they loved it, and I will suggest some similar reads. There is a Google form included in today's show notes if you would like to send in a request. If you love to read, I hope you'll consider joining my Patreon group to access additional content, including bonus episodes and early reads with prepub author chats. For March, there are two books, Colleen Oakley's new book, The Mostly True Story of Tanner and Louise, and Fifth Avenue Glamour Girl by Renee Rosen. And for April, my selection is The Comeback Summer by writing duo Allie Brady. The link to join is in the show notes. For this behind-the-scenes episode, I am chatting with Davina Morgan-Witz about her company, Book Browse. She is the founder and publisher of Book Browse, which since its beginning in 1998 has grown to become one of the internet's leading resources for book club members and those who read to expand their horizons. Davina was born and educated in England, where she held a variety of advertising, marketing, and research roles for a range of products, including chocolate bars, bottled water, dog food, banks, and cheese. She founded Book Browse after moving with her husband to the United States. Nowadays, she is delighted to spend her time talking about books and book clubs. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks AG1 for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Davina. How are you today? I am very well, Cindy, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so glad you're here because I have used Book Browse for quite some time. I just think it is such a wonderful resource, and I'm really looking forward to making sure all of my listeners are aware of it as well. Well, I hope I can tell you something useful about it. Well, before we dive into all of my questions, let's talk a little bit about Book Browse. So it's a website that provides a guide to exceptional books, a curated site. Can you tell me a little bit about it? So as you rightly say, we are a curated resource of the best and most interesting books with an emphasis on books for book club members and those who read to expand their horizons. I don't know about you, but I'm just too long in the tooth in terms of reading years to have any interest in staying up until two o'clock in the morning to just find out that he killed her. I want to learn something from the books. So we focus on picking out and selecting the best in class books for an audience of book clubbers and those who want to learn from what they read. I think that's probably why I like Book Browse so much, because that's the focus of my podcast as well. Not so much necessarily the book club focus, though I do think a lot of the books I talk about and interview authors for are good for that, but more to curate because there's just so much coming out all the time and there's no possible way any one person can keep up with it all. So trying to provide a resource and a guide to help people narrow down what they want to read. Exactly. I mean, you know, when I look through the list of people you've interviewed, it's such a good match for the books that we feature on, on Book Browse. And, you know, you can't be all things to all people. If you try to do that, you, you aren't anything to anyone. So we have a clear focus and we stick with it. 
Well, I can't wait to talk about all the different resources you have. But first, let's talk a little bit about your membership option. You have the option to become a member, and I'd like to hear what that provides. And then you have an option if you just want to sign up for your newsletters and access the website. You have portions of the website available to anyone. Yes. So we actually have two membership options for individual members. So let me back up. There's a lot of information available for free on Book Browse, and the great majority of our 600,000 or more monthly unique visitors are viewing the free content. But happily, there are a portion of our audience who believe in us sufficiently and want to support us by becoming individual members. And they then get access to all of Book Browse resources, including all our hand picked reader like recommendations by title and author. We've actually got more hand-picked recommendations than any other site, as far as I know. Most sites who offer reader likes, you know, if you like this, try that, do it by algorithm. We work as an editorial team to pick those books so we can cross over from fiction to nonfiction. We can we do more than just pick books that are in the same setting. We look at the, you know, the author's writing style, the themes and all sorts of aspects to make links that aren't necessarily going, going to be found by the algorithms. Also, but beyond the book articles, where we every time we feature a book, we explore a, an aspect behind the book. Another thing that the members get ac- access to are the first impressions books and the book club books, where we share books monthly with US based members with the understanding that they'll either write a review for our early reader program, First Impressions, or they'll join a discussion on Book Browse in our forum about the book. And so that's, you know, a few of the features that the membership get access to. That There's a lot more. But in addition to individual members, we also offer subscriptions so that libraries can subscribe, so that all their patrons and staff get access, and not just when they're in the library, from anywhere, anytime, from any device. So that is also a popular option. And we have libraries across the country who subscribe to that. I was not aware of the second one. I am a member and I have been a member in the past and I love accessing the first impressions. I have done that in the past and I love all your book club conversations and seeing the discussions and even reading them if I didn't participate myself. But that's fascinating on the library side. Yes, it's something that came about when we first moved to membership back over 10 years ago now. It was a decision we made because Frankly, I'd been running Book Browse as an overgrown hobby for a number of years, and it had reached the point where it was all absorbing, but there was very little revenue at all, and we needed to find a revenue stream to stay to stay in business. I did not want to go the sort of paid editorial route, for the, the you know the, the advertorial thing, because I didn't want to muddy the boundary between what is advertising and what is editorial, and advertising alone simply does not pay the bills. So we came up with this, you know, membership option. And at that time, libraries came to us and said, well, can we have your reader's advisory service? And I, in my naivety, said, what's reader's advisory? And they said, oh, discovering books. And I said, oh, yes, we can do that. But of course, actually creating the technical ability to support the libraries was a much bigger project. But now we have a product which, as I said, libraries can subscribe to. The patrons can access from anywhere, anytime, from any device. And in fact, unlike any other service we know about that's available through a library, what sets Book Browse apart is you don't have to go to your library website and click on the link on your library website in order to access the site. You can actually log in directly to Book Browse and start browsing at any time as a patron. So if I'm a library patron from a library that subscribes to Book Browse, They've given me the login information. I can just go straight to Book Browse and log in. Exactly. Oh, that's so nice. All you need to do, uh, for example, our local library, Santa Clara County Library, go to bookbrowse.com slash SCCL, and you'll be browsing as a patron of that library. Got it. Oh, that's a really cool feature. Well, how and when did you decide to launch Book Browse, and what did it look like initially? It looked initially like every other website on the internet back in 1998. Very, very basic. I started it because my now very adult daughter was three at the time, and she loved the world. She loved the world so much that she had to hug everybody in it. 
And going out anywhere with her was a liability because she would, as soon as I let go of her hand, she would disappear and I'd find her hugging somebody, hugging entire rows of people, (laughs) just exploring her wonderful, beautiful world. So while I loved her nature, it just wasn't very safe to go out and try and look inside a book and read a few pages in a bookstore or a library. So I thought, well, there's this new internet thing. I can go and dial up my AOL connection and go and look at Amazon and so and find books there. And so I went to Amazon and I found a couple of books that looked interesting and I bought them. And when they arrived, I found they were absolute rubbish. The reason I'd picked the wrong books was I hadn't been able to open the book and read a few pages as I would have if I'd been in the bookstore or library. And so the basic premises of Book Browse was simply to provide excerpts online because nobody at that time was doing that. On Amazon, all you could find at the time was the jacket description. You initially started with being able to browse. And what happened from there? Slowly over time, we added more and more features. Initially, I thought we would just uh, basically combine the best features of being in a bookstore with reading the Sunday newspapers. So we gathered together the essence of the media reviews for each book and an excerpt so people had the information they could to decide for themselves. And then people started saying, well, what's your opinion of the book? So we slowly segued into writing our own reviews. And then people kept on emailing and saying, I've read this book, what should I read next? And so I realized that instead of madly writing emails trying to recommend books, we could build that reader-like function into the website. And of course, at the time we were coming up as a website was also the huge boom in book clubs. It was the time of the early Oprah years, and book clubs were taking off all over the place. And our focus was quickly moving to the books that frankly interested me, which were the ones which have things to think about to discuss. And so then we started building out the whole book clubs part of the website. So over time, as people started asking for different things, consumers are saying, I'd love more book club information, or I'd love additional resources about this book, you just continue to add features. Exactly. We are highly research-driven, in, in, by which I mean we constantly are asking our visitors what they like, what they don't like. On any given year, we're probably researching six or 7,000 people and have been doing for over the last 15 years. So many, many research surveys are asking people directly about what they like about book browse, but also asking about aspects of their book club, their reading interests, everything to try and provide a resource which meets the need of our particular type of reader. I enjoy those surveys and I always try to take them. And I think in the last day or two, one has come out about my favorite book club books from last year. Actually, that survey, we've just been running it and we hope to have the results online in the next couple of weeks in the blog. This will be, I think, our third or fourth year of running the best books of the year. It's the book club perspective. So it's the most popular books of the previous year. And it's absolutely fascinating to see how the books change over time and how some of them have just such evergreen longevity. It is really interesting to see the cycles and what's popular and what continues to be popular and what authors are popular. So I always think it's fascinating. And I have the survey to take. I haven't done it yet. To me, in fact, what is fascinating about these survey results is in part the top 10 list, but it's also the incredibly long tail of popular books. I mean, the world of book clubs is so broad. And, you know, there are certain books that keep on popping up to the surface in terms of popularity. But the range and breadth of what people are reading is just amazing. And the discussions people are having about such a wide, wide range of books and interests. Most definitely. Well, how do books get on your radar? How are you choosing what you're going to review and what you're going to suggest for book clubs? How does that process work for you? It starts about six months ahead when the publishers put out their future season catalogue. So, for example, about two months ago, two or three months ago now, ago, we were starting to look at the summer catalogues. And so we go through all those summer catalogues, which back in the day when they used to arrive in the mailbox, would be probably two foot of solid print and is now all online. And we go through those page by page, looking for the books that we feel look on paper 
to be ones that are going to be right for us. Then as time gets closer, we are scanning the pre-pub magazines, Publishers Weekly, Kirkus, all those ones, to find what the early reviewers are saying about the books that we've already got on our watch list and adding additional books that we missed from the catalogues. And then even closer to publication, we're then filtering through those books to see what the consensus of opinion is in order to put the best of those on Book Browse. Because as we've already discussed, we can't list every book under the sun. People don't have time to read about them. They certainly don't have time to read them. And so we're only interested in telling people about the books that are really standing out. That makes sense. And I go through a similar process of trying to look ahead, get the books read before I decide who I want to interview. But it can be really tricky because a book will sound really good, but maybe it won't be a great fit for me. Or I'll skim right over something and then all of a sudden everybody's talking about it. And I was like, oh, shoot, that one got by me. Indeed. Yes, I have experienced that. It's hard not to with so many books. (laughs) Exactly. Well, let's talk about various aspects of your site. And then you can talk about whether it's membership or free to make that distinction for people. But the first thing that I always use regularly is the weekly release information. I send that out to my patrons and my Patreon group every week, highlighting from your list the popular books coming out every week. So how do you determine what goes on that list? The books that go on the list are essentially how they get on is the process I described a moment ago of filtering through and the books that we believe are the consensus opinion is at least four stars. They're the ones we're putting on, so long as they're books that are right for our audience. I mean, there could be four starred reviews from all the major pre-pub magazines for a bodice-ripping historical romance set in the Georgian period, and it's not going to get on book browse. So if it fits our audience and it's getting solid reviews, then it will go into that publishing this week list. And for free, you can get, you can sign up to our publishing this week newsletter and it will arrive in your mailbox every Sunday morning with the week's notable books, which depending on the season, because of course the publishing seasons vary so much month by month, that could be anything from half a dozen books to 30 books in the newsletter. And for free, you can also go to the website and see those books. You can also see all the books that are publishing in that month on Book Browse. What is membership only are the books publishing for future months. And if you're a member or a library, a librarian, for example, you can also download a spreadsheet of all the books that we are listing in a given month with the ISBN number, the page count and a link to the book to make it very easy to to order if, if you want to. Oh, that is a great resource for libraries, but I would love that resource as well, just to kind of make sure I haven't missed anything. And I've clearly Miss that on your site, but I'm going to go find it when we're done because I think that would be very helpful for me as well. And I get your emails every Sunday and I scan right through them and I'm looking at the reviews and the numbers and everything and seeing if it matches up with kind of what I thought. Also seeing if there's anything that that I did not know about ahead of time. I'm glad it's useful to you and we will try and make the link to the spreadsheet more prominent. You'll find it actually on the publishing by month page. Okay, good. Well, I'm going to go check that out as soon as we're done. So the other thing I was curious about was today's top picks. So you have a tab that says today's top picks, and I wondered how you chose what went on to that. So we've already got our hardcore of 60 to 100 notable books that we are profiling in any given month through the process we've discussed. What seem to be the very best and most relevant to our audience of those books go on a short list which gets sent to our professional reviewers one by one so that they can pick the book that they want to review. And the reason we don't assign books like I think most other places do is for two reasons, actually. The first is that I think that by allowing the reviewer to make the decisions about which books they want to review, we get a wider editorial profile than we would if all the selections were being made by a very small group of people. Also, it ensures that the person who's reviewing the book is a good fit for the book. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've read so many reviews where somebody slams a book because it was clearly just not for them, particularly sometimes in the major media, the New York Times, Washington Post, 
where a book's been sent to an expert in their field, in the book's field. But the book is clearly for a general audience. And the fact that that book isn't as good as the seminal work published in 1965 is actually entirely irrelevant to the audience for that book, who are not going to read 15 books about Lincoln. They're just going to read one. So by matching the reviewers up to the books, we just feel that we get a really good range of different books on the site and people who are just suited to the books. I agree with that completely. I review for Book Reporter and they assign similarly. They send out a spreadsheet. We mention the books that appeal to us and then they do some form of matching up. But I would find it very difficult if I was just sent a book having no say in whether it was going to appeal to me or not to then review it. So I definitely think your approach of letting people choose what sounds good to them is by far the best way to do it. And I think something that also sets us apart is that the list goes to the reviewers one by one. So there's no panicked rush to pick the high profile books. They have time to look through the list and pick the books to explore that debut author they've never heard of and decide if maybe that's the book for them, as opposed to everyone grabbing the latest and greatest big name author. Because in fact, actually, we're not really about the highest profile authors. We, If we had one spot left to fill, I would much prefer to have a debut or lesser known author fill it. And I really have very little interest at all in the really high profile, the John Grishams, the Pattersons of this world, because they don't need publicity. They don't need awareness. Their audience already know about their books. I agree. And that's my approach I take on the podcast almost always. Every once in a while, there'll be somebody really big who I'm a huge fan of. And so I'm like, okay, I would love to talk with them about their book. But for the most part, I try to target those authors and books that maybe people aren't going to know as much about. Absolutely. Who are your reviewers? How do you decide who's going to review for you? We have an application form on the website. It's linked from the bottom of all pages. And we ask people to submit two samples of their reviews. And then we filter through and decide who we would like to give a chance to review. In any given month, we probably get about 150 applications. So we are very selective. To be honest, many of those applications are essentially non-starters. We've unfortunately ended up on a lot of websites for make money on the internet. And so people come along and you know fill in the application form and really shouldn't be wasting their time. But we go through each single application to find the ones that we're interested in. We then contact the applicant with our reviewer packet explaining how we work and what's expected. And if they want to proceed, we then sign them up as a reviewer. We assign them a first book. They write their review and their Beyond the Book article because every book that we feature, we also write this Beyond the Book article because books to me, are jumping off points. They're not an end destination in themselves. They are an opportunity to learn. So we explore an historical, cultural, contextual aspect of the book in the Beyond the Book articles, and they form an integral part of what we offer on Book Browse. I love those. They're so much fun to wind through and figure out, you know, what's appealing to me right now and more behind the scenes information. So anytime I pull up a book on Book Browse, I'm going to see a review, most likely. I'm going to see the critics' reviews, sometimes members' reviews, sometimes book club information, and then this beyond the book detail, correct? If it's a featured book, yes. You'll almost always see an excerpt, the media reviews, as you say, the jacket information, oftentimes a reading guide, sometimes an interview. Essentially, we'll package up all the information we can find so that you as a reader can make your own informed decision. We're not telling you what to read. We are shortlisting down and then giving you the information that you can decide which is right. And I was so curious about the author interviews because I was looking at some of those today and they're written interviews. And so you just decide who you're going to interview, send them questions, and then you hear back from them. Or are they done audio wise and somebody transcribes them? What does that process look like? In fact, Actually, because there are so many wonderful people in the world like yourself doing interviews, on the whole, or podcasts, on the whole, we don't do our own interviews. Instead, we get permission from the source who has created the interview and then pull it into Book Browse with the appropriate byline to, to the interview. Maybe one in 10 we do, but on the whole, we focus on other things because there are many people out there who are already covering that area. I wondered about that because there are many people covering that area in print or in audio or in video at this point. 
So yes, it is, is easy to find an interview, but that's a great way to consolidate it down. And you do that with a lot of the reading guides as well, right? Because I know I have located reading guides on your site that I also find on an author's site or a publisher's site. Yes, most of the publisher, most, most of the reading guides you'll see anywhere on the web are created by the publishers. We do create a fair number of reading guides in relation to our book club discussions, and then they become the publisher's guide and are used elsewhere. But again, most of that content comes in from publishers and is freely available to everyone, as are the interviews. Anything that publishers provided like an excerpt is always available to, for free on Book Browse. The, beyond the book articles, for example, those only a portion of those are available to non-members. Only a portion of the reader-like recommendations are available. Only a portion of the future previewed books are available. But anything that the standard information across the web, like, like reading guides, are available for free. I've used those a number of times when I've been running book clubs. So they're very handy and it's nice to find everything in one place on your site. Thank you. So let's talk about book clubs. Who selects what you read and then who monitors the discussions and, and sets all of that up? The books that we select to discuss are in collaboration with the publisher. We only aim for two discussions a month at the most in order to not sort of overwhelm the discussion forum with too much going on and so that people can focus on the latest discussions. They are always moderated. The moderator keeps a low profile. Really, they're just ticking over just in case something goes wrong. But our mem are the people who take part in the discussions are universally wonderful and polite and listen to each other. It's something we really encourage in the discussion forum. Unlike the model that I saw years ago on, well, I, yeah, unlike the model that I see in some places where you've got forums where you get loads and loads of people participating, that they're all talking over each other or having side conversations, often about their cats, it would seem. And that may be fun and interesting for the people who are taking part at the time, but it's pretty useless for somebody coming to the discussion later, trying to work out whether that book is going to be right for their book club. And so what we're creating is what is essentially a small group of people who are talking to each other, listening to each other, and responding to each other's comments, so that when that conversation naturally runs its course, and we do close the discussions after about four or five weeks to new posts, that then serves as a resource forever for people looking for ideas of what to discuss, what topics might do well in their book club, whether that discussion is going, whether that book itself is going to be useful for their group in a way that I don't honestly see in other places because the conversations aren't as focused as we keep them. And that's really the moderator's job is to keep the conversation focused to make sure that we don't spawn extra topics that are already overlapping with something we're discussing so that it's a cohesive long-term resource for people. And people aren't just talking about their cats. And no discussion about cats, unless it's a book about cats. Exactly. Then it's okay to bring in your cat. But I do think they're very helpful. And I've gone back through them when I am trying to decide whether a book is going to be good for book club, or sometimes even if I'm going to be doing an interview, if I haven't done one initially when the book has first come out, it's just a good way to kind of flip through and think about some of the important topics from that book. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about first impressions. So first impressions is our early reader program. Basically, every month we offer maybe four or five books to our members. And we, again, we work in collaboration with the publishers on these books. And we say to the members, these are the books available this month. Only pick a book if it really appeals to you. And you have time to read and review it within the next five to six weeks, preferably less if possible. And so the books get placed with, with the members. The members review the books and then the reviews are posted on Book Browse in the first impressions section as member, member reviews. One of the strengths of the first impressions program from the point of view of reader review opinion is that it is essentially impossible to game the system, by which I mean on a site such as Goodreads, you can have people who are connected with the book, enthusiastic friends, or maybe even people who are being paid to write reviews, writing reviews. And it's very difficult to distinguish between what is real and what is false. And obviously, you can follow individuals and, you know, and believe you, 
trust them and they are entirely trustworthy. But as a corporate communication review source, it can be just like Amazon or anywhere else. It can be a little bit flawed. Whereas because members request a book, but we assign the books essentially based on when somebody last received a book. So the priority goes to people who haven't, who've received a book less frequently than others. It's almost impossible for sufficient people connected with the book to have an influence on the consensus review for that book. That's so funny that you mentioned Goodreads, because I know that is definitely an issue and has been for a while. But I have noticed in the last three or four months, for me at least, it's gotten a lot worse. Like I will look up a book that's not coming out for four or five months, and I'll either have a super low review, and I'll be like, oh, I guess I'll pass on it. And then it comes out, and then all of a sudden it's like 4.2. And I'm like, what happened? Or the flip side of it, which I understand is what you're saying, people who know the author. There's like a 4.5, and I'll get the book, and I'll think, oh, this is not at all for me, or I don't see what all the 4.5 business is about. And by the time the book comes out, it has like a 3.5. So I have been not worrying so much about what's happening on Goodreads, especially ahead of time, because I feel like it's not any kind of gauge for the book and whether I'm going to like it or not. I honestly don't spend enough time there to have to have seen the flow the way you 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 say, but I can quite believe that because yes, I, I I do often see just one or two, and then suddenly there is a flood. So yes, yes, I I do I do see see what you mean by that. I think it's nice though that you know your reviews are going to be what people actually thought about the book, and I think that's one of the reasons I go to Book Browse for some of these things because then I can see okay, what did regular people honestly think about this book. Exactly. And we encourage people to just say it as they see it. The other thing that I love about your site are the literary quizzes and some of the various games you have related to books. That part is so much fun. Oh, yes. Thank you. And we've actually recently launched a new section of of quizzes. We, we, we've had the word play for years and we sometimes have sweepstakes and we have various guess the author quizzes and pronunciation guides. You know, we have a pronunciation guide for for the authors on our website, and we've turned that into a game, so you can kind of try and guess what what the pronunciation is. But we've recently started more literary quizzes, and I I personally just enjoy creating them, and I'm still trying to get the balance between sufficiently challenging that it's interesting and not not to the point of being frustrating. I send those out to my Patreon group as well periodically because I think they're so much fun. Well, thank you so much. Yes, the other interesting thing about first impressions is only less than a quarter of our membership ever take part in the offers. So this is, this is something that people take part in because they like to share their reviews. They like to take part in the discussions. It's not because they want free books. You know, if people want free books, they can go to the library. And so again, we attract those who really want to engage in the world of book reviewing or discussing books. Well, I think the way you handle it, where you have a limited number and you alternate between members so that if somebody does get a book and they don't review it, then you can pretty much say, okay, next time around you don't get a book. So I think it does encourage those people that are going to interact and are going to review the book. It does. Although we, you know, if somebody has a good reason for not reviewing, I mean, life happens. Many reasons people may not want to review a book. And we're not going to hold their feet to the fire if it's just simply not the book for them. And we invite reviews, both good, bad and indifferent. But if somebody has picked a book that is clearly just not for them or some life event happens, they can absolutely opt out and we're not going to hold it against them in any form. So, again, we don't want people to write reviews or feel they have to say something good because they think they're going to get points for it. We encourage people to say it as it is. Absolutely. But most of the time, those that are reviewing are going to read the book and then turn in a review. Yes, absolutely. We have a very high response rate, over 80%. Well, where do most people spend their time on Book Browse? Do you know? Well, the book club section and the information there is very popular. One of the things, you know, I see sites out there which are focused only on book clubs, but we prefer to have a general interest site with lots of different resources which also provides book club information because, you know, people who are in a book club are generally only in a book club for maybe one, two, maybe three days a month. And the rest of the time, they are just general readers finding books in the same places that, you know, all of us do. And so we have the general information, but we also have the book club resources. Uh, So that's very popular. 
we also a lot of interest in our categories. We categorize books not just by genre, but also by time period, by setting, and a wide range of themes. So you can cross you can cross reference as a member. You can cross reference. So let's say I'm going on vacation in Italy, and I love historical fiction. I can go to Book Browse, and I can say. I want a historical fiction book set in Italy. Oh, and let's have it have a strong female lead as well. And I can pull up a list of books, and it won't be a huge list because we're not recommending every book under the sun. It's just going to be a short list of books. So that's a very popular feature amongst our membership. The Beyond the Book articles, because they're so unique, nobody else is doing anything like we do on a regular basis. They are also very popular. So it really, it's very much across the board. I can see that because you do offer a lot of features, and so it probably just depends on what each individual is looking for. So tell me your plans for the future with Book Browse, Davina. I think just keep on doing what we're doing, slowly enhance, listen to what our readers want, and add features that meet their needs. I'm sure it's been interesting since you started in 1998, and we're now in 2023, to see all the various changes, not only with your site, but just with technology over that time. Yes, it has been an extraordinary transition. And honestly, I don't think we could have done what we did now because the barriers to entry are so great that to start a website from scratch and build it to where we are now would take an enormous amount of funding. Whereas, you know, back when we, I was able to start it and just tick over coding pages myself for the first few years and slowly then introduce a database in a way that you just couldn't do now. And we, you know, we've never taken funding. We've always been totally self-supporting. And I think it would be very difficult to do that these days. I think that's right. And I think it's a crowded field these days. But because you've been around a long time, that helps because people trust you and know that you're going to be a very valid and trusted source. I hope so. Well, before we wrap up, what have you personally read lately that you really liked? Oh, dear. Where to start? I have to mention the Nazi conspiracy. That's the Brad Meltzer and and Josh Mensch book about the conspiracy to kill Roosevelt, Stalin and Churchill in Tehran during a conference during um, World War II in 1943, which is fascinating. Abraham, uh, the the Gizis' new book, The Covenant of Water, um, he's the author of Cutting the Stone. I think that was about a decade ago. And he's got a new book coming out in May, I think it is, from Grove. And that is set in Kerala in the southwest of India. And if you read to learn, it is just fascinating. It is so evocative and beautifully written. Wade in the Water by Nayami uh, Nakuma. That is a story that's set in the 1980s. In the in Mississippi, but it's rooted in the Freedom Summer murders of um, che, who was uh, Schwerner, Goodman, Cheney, I think I can't remember. And so that's you know really wonderful debut historical fiction. Stealing by Margaret Verbal, another one that you know just beautifully written. And what else? Africa is not a country. Uh, oh, and Demon Copperhead, Barbara Kingsolver. That is just beautiful. And I could go on, but that's. <laughs> That's what happens, right? When you ask a book lover, what do you recommend? The list is on and on. Sometimes people will text me and I'll send like two or three texts. And then literally like a day later, I'm still like, oh, yes, and I forgot. And I'm I'm like, okay, I will stop now. But it's hard because you start thinking of all the books you love and want to recommend. Well, that's exactly how the reader likes came out on Book Browse was people would email and say, you, you know, I've read this and what do you recommend? And I would write back and say, try this. And then half an hour later, I think, oh, I should have said this. And so it was kind of getting that down on the site. So it would be a resource for everyone. I'm doing a read-alike segment on my podcast now on Tuesdays. People will submit a book that they loved and they'll tell me why they loved it because I do think that's so important for a read-alike. And then I will suggest three books, sometimes more, depending on the books. And it's so much fun. It's really fun on my end to do it, but I've been getting great feedback for the people that I've recommended it to and others as well. Good. I mean, you are an extraordinary resource. I mean, columnist, social media maven, book reviewer, podcaster, what don't you do? (laughs) Well, the nice thing about it is that I can read one book and use it for a variety of those things. You know, it's not like I'm using separate books each place. But still, yes, it does keep me a little bit busy. Yes. 
Well, this has been wonderful, Davina. I'm just so happy we got to chat because as I've mentioned a number of times, I love book browse. I use it all the time. And I just want to make sure that everyone else is aware of it as well. I'm sure many of my listeners are, but I'm sure there may be a few that aren't. This is a great way to introduce them. Well, I really appreciate being invited on and I appreciate, you know, you sharing information about Book Browse because we don't have the big budgets to do major advertising. Really, we're built entirely by word of mouth. So thank you, Cindy. Absolutely. And thank you for taking the time to come on and speak with me. Thank you. Goodbye. Don't you know that you're a grown up? I'm a grown up. Me too. Yep, me too. But you know, these days being a grown up can really suck. Luckily, we're grown ups who grew up in the coolest generation. We had video arcades. And also some of the best TV and movies ever made. We lived the origin of awesome consumer electronics. The list goes on and on. Yep, Generation X. Exactly. And we're Gen X Grown Up. Every week, the Gen X Grown Up podcast explores media, tech, toys, games, and more from both yesterday and today. Through the eyes of Generation Xers who absolutely love that stuff. You can find us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Or find us on our website, genxgrownup.com. All right, you think that was good enough? I I hope so, man. I'm tired. (laughs) Who listens to a promo on a podcast and then goes and listens to a different podcast? (laughs) I've never done it. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you like this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts From a Page. Consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. Tell all of your friends about the show and rate it or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it. I hope you'll tune in next time. I'm a grown-up. Me too. Yep, me too. But you know, these days, being a grown-up can really suck. Luckily, we're grown-ups who grew up in the coolest generation. We had video arcades. And also some of the best TV and movies ever made. We lived the origin of awesome consumer electronics. The list goes on and on. Yep, Generation X. Exactly. And we're Gen X Grown-Up. Every week, the Gen X Grown-Up podcast explores media, tech, toys, games, and more from both yesterday and today. Through the eyes of Generation Xers who absolutely love that stuff. You can find us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Or find us on our website, genxgrownup.com. All right, you think that was good enough? I I hope so, man. I'm tired. (laughs) Who listens to a promo on a podcast and then goes and listens to a different podcast? Right. I've never done it. (laughs) Right.